podcast about the intersection between humans and technology. My name is Guthrie. I'm here with Susan. Hello, Susan. Hi, Guthrie. How are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, that's good. I was uh, I was I was attempting some home repair today. Yeah, how'd and, that go? Uh, it all went sideways <laughs> for me. Is your house still standing? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, good. Just, then it still... wasn't too bad. Uh, I I live in an old house and it has these old ancient uh joists and in my head i was just going to just do a little small little thing they are so old and so hard you you just you can't you can't even can't do anything they're just so ancient and hard they they do not want to be messed with they are that's what it is i swear they're harder than most metals (laughs) maybe oh i get it the house is so old, it has turned into petrified wood, so it's actually stone. Yeah, it's functionally. I... Maybe it is stone. Are you sure it's wood? <laughs> yeah, it looks Does like it... I mean, I'm not kidding. It sounds like it's stone. 140-year-old timber. You need a diamond bit or something to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, this is, uh, that's sort of what I'm... Yeah, so... Yeah, right. like you, if you, anything you have that is, you know, house repair, I can tell you I have lots of empathy and absolutely no answers whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. You are talking to the wrong person if you're talking to me about okay. house repairs. Okay. Just not okay. mention that. All right. Well, what we are doing today. Yeah, we're not talking. This is not a DIY house repair podcast. We, we episode. need, uh, hold on. Do they have like, let's try to see if they have, um, little uh uh what uh what are you looking for so we we use a program called restream and i was just trying to see if they had like any like like punchy kind of like sound effects (laughs) you know so like 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 we're like a like a hammering or something or what oh no sort of like a diy oh like a a, an electric intro Okay. Yeah. Some, some some sort of. A, that I don't, is I totally know. bizarre. I don't know what you just did. I don't know. I was I was trying to I was trying to have some sort of like uh like home uh, improvement. I didn't know you if know, we were going like to come really back or not. Music. This is not what we're what our topic is today, Guthrie. Sorry. After all this excitement, I'm afraid I'm going to be boring. That's fine. All right. Let's 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 get uh, let's get to it. This is uh we are continuing our lecture series. Um, yeah. Doing something, uh, not unrelated, but different we're sort of moving on to a new topic is that correct well we're no actually similar topic but just a deep dive into it so the last session we did was on some fundamentals of of ux and design research and so this session now that we covered some fundamentals i want to i want to talk more deeply about different kinds of research and i actually have a i don't know like a random set of uh tips and techniques for for doing specific kinds of UX and design research. Does that sound okay? Yeah. So I'm gonna get um I'm gonna get pretty practical and kind of in the weeds if if you don't mind that. So uh you know I know that we we record video and put that out there, but I also know that a lot of people are listening to this and not watching it. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to, I'm going to describe something. Uh, So if you can imagine Guthrie, a continuum and it has, it's going to have three boxes on it and uh, all the way to the, to the right. Now I'm trying to figure out in the video, is it the opposite? No, all the way to the right is something called evaluative research. That's what's in the box to the right. In the middle is a box that we're going to call uh, uh, user feedback. And then all the way to the left is a box we're going to call generative research. And I want to talk about um, these three pieces, and I want to talk about tips and techniques that uh, I think apply to all three boxes, and then some that apply just to, to some boxes and not others. 
So I want to start by going all the way to the right and talking about evaluative research. And I put it to the right because I think if you're talking about like a timeline, I don't know. Evaluative research is research you do to evaluate the user experience and the effectiveness of a particular product or of a particular prototype. But, um, and I think we mentioned this in the last session, it assumes that you have a product or a prototype. Like you're, you're, you're that far down the road. That's why I put it all the way to the right. You're that far down the road that you have something that you actually want to evaluate. You've designed it. It exists, even if just in prototype form, it does exist. There is a design for this product. And so uh, you want to get feedback on the design decisions that you made. And that's that's what evaluative research is. So I want to talk about some tips and techniques for doing this kind of research. Um, and, and some of these are tips and techniques. Well, let's see. Yeah, so let, let's talk about specific techniques for the, this kind of research. So one thing is, uh, I want to talk about what this type of research is not. So if you are truly evaluating the user experience of an existing product or prototype, you uh, do not want to do that by giving someone a demo of the product and then saying, so what did you think? So when you're doing this kind of research, you really need to have it be task-based. You need to give um, a user, a person who is representative and typical of the person who is going to be using this product, and you want to have them do very specific tasks. And when you set, this takes a fair amount of work to set up. If you're not used to doing this kind of research, it can be a little hard to get used to. Once you get used to doing it, it gets easier and easier. You need to prepare a series of tasks you're going to have people do. And how many tasks? Well, depends on how long the tasks are and how much time you're going to do. Typically, evaluative research is maybe, maybe you have an hour. And if you have an hour, it really means you have 45 minutes or actually more like 40 minutes by the time people show up and they show up late because they can't get the team's meeting working or they didn't know what building they were supposed to come to they show up and then you have to give them the instructions and say hello and all those things and then they do the tat by the time you do that you've lost 20 minutes so you have a max really of 40 minutes it's not a lot of time Sometimes people say to me, well, we're going to schedule two hour sessions. It's like, well, no, it's too long. People are going to get tired. Your later tasks are not going to be accurate data because people are tired. So really you should schedule one hour sessions max and assume you really have 40 minutes for the tasks. Now, sometimes people do much shorter tasks. So Guthrie, you and I have both... Um, worked with some of the tools uh, where there's a panel built in, like not only, you know, do you have the tool that and people do the test remotely, but, you know, you're hiring their panel, their people to do the test. Those are typically 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most. That is really not much. So you can't get a lot done in a situation like that, and you just have to live with that, which means you have to prioritize. You have to decide which tasks you really want people to do and what order do you want them to do in. And not everybody works through tasks in the same amount of time. So you should assume that the ones that are at the end, some people will get them done and other people will not get them done. So whichever tasks are most important for you to collect data on, they've got to be towards the front or you will not get to them. Now, having said that, I do want to say something about the very first test you give someone to do during an evaluative design feedback session. Sometimes people call these user tests because that's you know just kind of traditionally what they're called. Um, the first task you give them needs to be really easy. Do not give them a task that's hard for them to understand or that's going to take a really long time to do. And the reason is people, believe it or not, are nervous about doing this. Now, if you have a 
professional tester, like someone who works for, you know, a, one of the panel companies and they do this, you know, five of these a day, they're not going to, you know, get thrown off by a difficult task. But if you're talking about just, you know, average person who doesn't do these very often, these tests, if you give them, you know, they're nervous coming in and you give them a hard task, it's hard to understand. They can't follow the directions. It's just going to, it's going to make them nervous. They're not going to, they're not going to react as they normally would. So I always look for a task they can do that is relatively easy. They do it and then they either in their head or sometimes you'll even hear them say out loud, oh, that wasn't too bad. So then they kind of relax into it and then, then you can, you know, get progressively more difficult. Sometimes people think I need to give them tasks to do that are in the order in real life that, about how they do the work. You don't have to do that. You can do that, but you don't have to. Um, so, you know, let's use an example of uh, if you were testing like an e-commerce website. I'll just use a really simple example. An e-commerce website that people normally buy multiple things when they come to the to the to the site, and so the normal task flow is they come in, they search for an item, they look for it, they read some reviews, they add it to the cart. Now they go look for another one, and they keep that up. And then at the very end, they check out. But if you have a lot of things you'd like to test, like the tests, like the filtering and advanced searching and whether they read reviews and some intricacies of the, the checkout process, you may not have time for all that. And so it's perfectly all right to have them come in, find a product, add it to cart, and, and actually, you know, go through the checkout process. And then you can go back and say, oh, let's do another one. Let's say this time that you're looking for, right? You can do that. It doesn't have to your whole session doesn't have to follow a really typical session. You can say things like, okay, now we're going to do something different and then just do something different. It's perfectly all right to do that. Another thing that is sometimes done with these tests is you may have um, multiple versions of a product. It, maybe it's a prototype and we have prototype version A and we have prototype version B and we want to get feedback on both versions. How are you going to do that? Well, just know that that if you show everyone version A first and then you have them use version B, you are getting some biased effects because whatever the conceptual model is for version A, that's going to affect how they react to version B. Um, if you showed them B first and then A, that's also going to happen. Sometimes what we do is we randomize the order. And Guthrie... I should say, I'm, I have so much to say here. I'm just going to go on and on and on and on. So if you have questions, you no. need to interrupt me. All right. No. Um, so you can, you could do half of the people start with A and half of the people start with B. And if you're going to do that, you should randomize the assignment. I've had people, they think I'm crazy, but I tell them literally, uh, I want you to, uh, put, put, um, put, the, the take a piece of paper and uh, write down the letter A and uh, take another piece of paper, write down the letter B, put these, seal these in an envelope. Uh, if you have, if you're testing eight people, you have four envelopes with A and four envelopes with B, and then you have someone mix up all the envelopes. So you don't know which ones are the A's and which ones are the B's. And when someone walks in the door for their test, you grab an envelope and you open it. And if it says A, then that means you're going to show them prototype A first and then prototype B. And if it says B, you do the opposite. So that it truly is randomized about the order. Uh, and that will at least help some of those order effects. Um, so, you know, there's lots, there's so many, so many ways you can do evaluative testing, so many things you can test on. Um, you want to, uh, do both, um, scenarios and tasks. So what I might do, Guthrie, is I might say, here's a scenario. You're going to go online and try and buy, uh, uh, a shirt for your 
uh, for a relative as a birthday present. That's the scenario. I set it up. Or maybe if it has to do with um, like business expense travel software, I say, here's the scenario. You've just gotten back from a trip and now you want to submit your travel expenses. So I'm setting it up. I'm giving the scenario. And then for the scenario, now I have a task. Task number one might be, uh, you know, enter your receipts. Task number two might be submit your expense report, you know, and so on. So you can have multiple tasks for each scenario, but you always want to give them the scenario first, and then you give them the task to do. Then you can go on to another scenario, which might have one or more tasks. So that's what you do when you're doing evaluative research. It takes a lot of time to set this up, a lot of time to write these scenarios and tasks. You have to, there's a whole art and craft and science to writing the tasks. So for example, the task should not, probably not say things like uh, open the software, go to the um, expenses tab, click on the expenses tab, and then click on enter new report, and then you know, you don't want to give them all those directions unless you're just trying to test whether they can follow directions. So you don't want to tell them what tab to clip on, click on. You, you need to avoid the names of the tabs and the names of the buttons. Um, you have to reword it uh, so that you're not giving away the answer. If what you really want to do is find out, can people do this task without knowing exactly what to click on? So there's a whole... There's a lot of work that goes into it. And what I highly, highly, highly recommend you do is uh, you may want to, uh, you want to test your, your protocol. So your protocol are these directions and you want to test it. And I often, you know, I'll test it with like a, just a colleague to see if I think there's any major gaffes that I missed. And then I test it with a real user and I leave time. Like if I'm testing with six people and uh, I, I, will I will schedule one of them on a different day so I can test with a real person, have time afterwards to see if I need to change my protocol because I might have screwed something up. And then the next day I start with everyone else uh, in case I had to change something. I have time to make changes. A real typical thing to do with this kind of test is to have um, to use the think aloud technique where you have people talk out loud while they do the test so you know what's going on in their head. Um, if this is not a professional tester, this is a weird thing and people don't know how to do it. And you can't just say, do you know what I mean by think aloud? Because they're just going to say yes, even though they don't. So you need to demonstrate the think out loud technique for them. Uh, you In an evaluative research test like this, you want to just let them do the task, observe what they do. You don't want to interrupt them a lot. You don't want to give them hints. You can ask some questions while they're doing it if you want to, or you can wait and ask some questions at the end of the task or at the end of the whole test. But you don't want to be helping them or saying, why don't you try clicking on this? You know, you don't, you don't want to do that. You're trying to see whether they can do the task without you uh, helping them through it. So that's kind of about, you know, how to do evaluative uh, research. And I think it's like the, what's the term, like the gold standard for research. Do you have any questions, Catherine? I know you've, you've been in some evaluative research sessions you've run I them. Have. Yes, run them. yes, that's certainly something that I have done. Um, you have any comments or questions or things you've noticed about them? You know, the gold standard, if that mm -hmm. is really what it is, uh, what's the, what's the, 
what's your what's your gold silver bronze standard <laughs> if that's the analogy you're going to use oh see i should never have used the term gold standard no um nice. you know okay there's a cuz there's certain you, uh, it's i almost want to say Huh? I almost want to say, well, you know, you have to do it to the gold standard. Like, don't do it any other way. No. Um, I guess I would say, you know, there are some things I won't, I won't give on, right? I won't give on poorly worded tasks or scenarios. I won't. You have to do it. You just have to. I guess I'll give some leeway. Uh, I'm going to talk in a minute of, uh, about, um, about, about, doing like mixed method, you know, um, can I, can I do, a, can I, can I get feedback from users that isn't like that strict a user test? Is there, you know, can I just get their feedback about some things? Right. Um, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that, but I guess, I guess as bronze would be, um, you do what I just said, but you mix in uh, some um, more informal converse, discussion, conversation, uh, generative research, interview type questions. Uh, that would be one change. Another one might be you ask a lot of questions while they're doing the test. You interrupt them because you want to know why did you choose that? Why did you choose this? There are so you can start to deviate from the strictness of it, and I think that would put you in bronze or silver category. And you can do that if you're really experienced. But that's the places where I see people get into an enormous amount of trouble. Enormous. The other thing I think would separate gold from silver and bronze would be um, uh, how many people you do the test on. Right? Like, yeah, I did a test with three people. Okay, you just went to the bronze level. Yeah, or you're not in gold anymore. It's just not enough people. Or, um, or, or, you know, I don't know if you remember, Guthrie, we went to visit a client who I will not name, will not name them. And uh, we asked them if they were did use your tests, and they said, absolutely. And I said, oh, that's great. Like, so give me a description, you know, and they talked about the software that they had developed. They did, did a test on, and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So did you go to the medical clinics to do that? Oh, no, no. Oh, really? How did you, because the software was for medical people, you know, how did you, how did you do it then if you didn't go to the clinic? Oh, we didn't go to the clinic. We didn't do the user test with medical people. We set up a table outside the cafeteria here at headquarters, and we just got, you know, anybody, uh, admin people, software developers, anyone that happened to walk by to go get lunch, we grabbed them and we <laughs> do the test. And I was like, uh-huh, that was not good. So that would put you, I don't even, you wouldn't even be in silver category then. You'd be, you'd be, uh, you'd be burnt so, sienna from the Crayola pack or something. And why, and why? Because unless you're, run, like I said, you can run a really rough pilot just to see if you've done something terribly wrong, like the URL you're sending people to is the wrong URL. But if you run a test on someone who's not your target audience, what can you learn from that? Like, oh, they can do the task. Sure, they're an expert. They know, they know your software. They develop the software. Uh, they, sure, they can do the task. Or, or, wow, you know, they're not the target audience at all. The, the target audience is like mechanical engineers. They're not a mechanical engineer. They're not going to be able to do anything. So this is all, um, I guess today is just statistics day because we had another call where I was talking about, someone asked the question, um, well, you know, why don't, don't we, don't we not want, 
a random sample, I get it in the negative. Wouldn't we want people to all be the same and have everything be very controlled? Um, because if we if we have people just out in the world, you know, uh, and I guess that in this case it would be your target audience, well, there's going to be differences because we can't control all the specific mm-hmm. variables that mm-hmm. exist. Like, what if they were, what if they're in a bad mood because there was traffic today? Right, right. And what I said was sort of the whole point of statistics. You have a target population that you want to know things about. Mm-hmm. And that target population is going to statistically be different. Mm-hmm. Some people will be over here. Some people will be over there. Mm-hmm. might have a bell curve. But all of that information about the differences, the variances, and how they're different, and if there are patterns within their differences, that's really important information because any natural population is going to have a lot of difference, a lot of variance. If you are not testing in your target population, you are adding, for just from a statistical perspective, you are adding in data points that are going to obscure Mm -hmm. data that you would not have otherwise noticed in your target population. And, And if you have enough, it's statistically significant. If you have a lot of people, you know, with this kind of testing, it's less people, but it's more in depth. So so you do have more opportunities to to discover things. And so one example, you know, we were talking with the, cl- the client we were talking to, it was, you know, they were using, you know, using some software and people were sort of saying whether they had a good time or not. And the question, you know, what if it, you noticed that every day from 430 to 545, the responses go down if you're, you know, well, what's happening? Well, maybe everyone was stuck in traffic by the time they got to wherever they're going, and now they're in like a grumpy mood. If you don't test in your target population, or if you do half and half or something like that, you, you're you just adding in extra noise, and you're going to miss uh, the details that your actual target population has that you don't know about. That's kind of the whole Yeah, point. yeah. But you know, okay, I understand what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying. And I want to add some things in here, though, you know, because one thing that happens when people do um, when people come to evaluative research and they're used to doing like quantitative market research, uh, you know, they're used to doing surveys with 5000 people. And then I say to them, "Okay, let's let's see if we can can get. Can we do 16? Yeah. Oh, 10. Can we get 10? 10 would be great. Let's oh. get 10 people for this test. And they're like, what? How can you possibly test with 10? So, you know, there's a there's a wonderful website called uh, Measuring Usability. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It's from our friend uh, Jeff Soro, S-A-U-R-O, wonderful researcher. And uh, I really recommend this website for anybody who's doing anything with UX or design a research. A real researcher, not like... like- he re- he's really a great researcher. And he has articles in, in which he's describing, you know, explaining statistical significance, confidence intervals, calculators to figure out how many people do we need to run in this test in order to make sure that we are getting statistically significant results. And and that is not the kind of research I'm yeah. talking about here with the value to research. Right. At, but I've done that research, and that's great research. And I'm not saying it's bad research or you shouldn't do it. Nothing we are saying is statistically very different. significant. We can't right. we can't sit here and say we've proven we've proven that this P, product you know, is usable. We, when we have experienced users. You know, of this mechanical engineers who've used our product, this is statistically significant. They're no, we can't make any claims like that. So, um, and thank you for bringing that up because you know, evaluative research is what you are looking for. Are there any big things 
that we have overlooked in our design, in our prototype, or if it's for an existing product that, you know, we're thinking about redesigning this product, let's go see what are the major friction problems in the existing product before we go and redesign it. So it is not at that granular level. Now, there are some very specific instances um, that, and, and actually this was a project I involved Jeff Sorrell with uh, when I was doing some testing on, uh, uh, on, you know, defibrillators that you see in the yes. airports that anybody's supposed to walk up and grab, you know, someone's having a heart attack and anyone walking through the airport is supposed to be able to grab one of these and help the person having a heart attack. Um, and a device like that has to be approved by the FDA if you're in the States. And the FDA requires that you be able to, to, run this evaluative research with statistical significance. And I was running this research and I did not know how many people we had to run it on. And I actually got Jeff and he asked me a bunch of questions and confidence intervals and all of that. And then ran it through his calculator and came back and told us we needed to do this test on 240 people. And let me tell you, testing 240 people on the same (laughs) software and hardware device it took a really long time, and we had multiple testers because otherwise they would have gone crazy. Um, yeah, so most of the time, no, it's not statistically significant. We're but talking. I about actually disagree with you a little bit on about the statistically what? significant portion, oh. because many of the things that we are talking, we're not we're not measuring our variables. We're not measuring the you know That's we're correct. not doing regression analysis. That's correct. But what we are doing is we are measuring soft stuff, and the soft stuff. What uh, can be quite statistically significant. I'll give you an example. Yeah. If you're looking for, is this task easy to complete? This is a vague nebulous something. Can the doctors do the task in a reasonable amount of time? Yeah. So if you have population number one, yeah. And the population number one is the real population that you've done the testing on. Okay. And let's just say that it takes them, uh, we'll just say 10 minutes to, uh, you know, the, the median time is 10 minutes to complete the task. And that includes frustration and I did the wrong thing and blah, blah, yeah. blah. So you're going to get some, you know, some people don't, you know, you do these tests and it's like, did not complete. You get some of that right, stuff. Right. And I'm not saying time on task is the be all end all. It's, right. It's, but let, it's a, you're just using that. It's, as it's as a measurement way. to measure. Yeah. Does it, does the software, is the software good? Does it yep. work? Okay. Now, ideally in the designer's head, before you test, the time to do this task because people wouldn't have been confused and filled out the whole form and then realized, oh, it's the wrong form and they had to go back and fill out the form again. In your imaginary sample in your head of how it's quote supposed to work, yes. your time and task is like two minutes, right. four minutes, right? right. They, they fill out the form, they do it. It doesn't include the time of all the people who got right. confused and went to the wrong page That's right. and filled out the page, and then there was an error, and then right. they go and back they had to and go back and start all over. So yeah. Even in this little simple one, you know, I, I I pulled up a statistical significance calculator. If you have, if you have two populations with only ten people in yeah. in each, so ten people yeah. is going to be the imaginary one. Yeah. That's your fake world. That that's your ideal. Yeah. And they, you know, they're they're doing. You know, they're doing that in uh, uh, two minutes. Yeah. And the you, the real sample is doing it in four minutes. Yeah. Right? That's that's 100% yeah. Yeah, increase. Yeah, yeah. You can be statistically significant okay. at right. 10. At, at, well, at 10 or 20. Like, like once yeah. you get to these really big things where things are 200, 300, 400%. Yes. Then you can get right. Then right. you can really get statistical significance even yes. with very small sample even size. Even with small sample size. You are so, right. And yeah. I am absolutely wrong. And thank you. No, no, you're right too, but because most of the time we don't we don't no. translate those things to numbers. But when I, we're doing this kind of testing, it is you can get you can figure out Yes. We don't we don't we don't go the full distance and make it statistically significant and we run the calculations. Should more than we do. But but there's a soft way to do it because you yes. run this test and you're like, yep, they are everyone. Eight of the ten people ran yeah. into the exact same problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's the problem we see it. Yes. It, it keeps yes. coming up over and over and over again. And yes. you figure it out pretty fast. You don't have to do a hundred. You don't. No, I agree with so. you. 
There you yeah, go. no, that's really interesting. And I think it's worthwhile then to, to, to perhaps even try out some of these uh, calculators and find out before you run the test, wait a minute, how many people would we need to run, you know, and, and you're right. Maybe you want to do some of these calculations. And and you bring up a really interesting point as well, which is what is it, you know, you'd want to think ahead of time, what is the data we want to collect? Some, you know, it just depends on what is it, what it is you're trying to learn or show. So you might want to be collecting how long does it take to do this task? Um, that So time on task is one. Number of errors you might want to cl uh, collect. Sometimes that's what's important. Uh you know, or just a yes, no, did, did they successfully complete the task? Yes or no. Um, it does not all have to just be uh, your qualitative observations, although those are very valuable, but you can actually collect data uh, along, you know, during the test along the way and, and look at that data. And I, I recommend that you do that even if you have very small um, sample sizes, that data can be really significant. You know, if, if, if you tested eight people and, um, no one made it through the task without, you know, a, at least two errors and the average number of errors was five, you know, that's like real, if you can re report that data, not just say people made a lot of errors, but actually say how many errors that is is useful and can help people make decisions. So I definitely think you, you, you want to stop and think about what data could we collect and and go ahead and collect it. That's that's what I would say. All right, Guthrie, that's good. Do you have any other comments? I would I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about some other kinds of research, but um, you know, I do I, I'm a huge fan of evaluative research, so I wanted to make sure we got, uh, got to spend a good amount of time on it. Yeah, I mean, now, now, uh, now I'm. Now yeah, I, I see got, you I, there. I'm like, oh my god! I, I, I hear I, you. I just, like, uh, said all the wrong stuff. I got to make sure. <laughs> that, uh, You're checking you know. out this. Uh, well, I'll let you do that. If you come up with something, you can interrupt me. Um, so let me let me just. So I'm going to switch topics now. And you remember I said we had a continuum and on the box all the way on the right was evaluative research. And now I'm going to do the box in the middle, which is I'm going to call uh, uh, user feedback sessions. So how is a user feedback session different from evaluative research? Um, a user feedback session is not necessarily asking people to do realistic tasks within scenarios and seeing where the problems are and perhaps measuring things like time on task or number of errors. Um, running a user feedback session implies that there's certain information you want to get feedback on, but you're not trying to evaluate the, the user experience of the interface. You actually have some questions and you need answers to the questions typically before you design or redesign. So a lot of time if you're if you're doing a user feedback session, you have not designed this product or you've you've done some initial initial design ideas, but you know, you don't have a product to show them. You don't have a prototype to show them. And because you're just not ready and you want to ask some questions. I remember I was working with a client recently and we were, um, you know, designing and doing some initial designs and, and I was asking them lots of questions. Well, you know, at this point, do people look up the information this way or do they look it up this, this way? And then, and there was like silence and, and these were people who knew their customers really well. Uh, and, and, you know, had built the previous product, but they didn't know the answers to a lot of my questions. And then finally, um, as it became apparent to me pretty early on that we were going to have to do some user feedback sessions, but uh, I kind of waited until finally one of my stakeholders said, you know, I think we need to go talk to the users and find out the answers to some of these questions. And it was like, yes, we need to pause on our design brainstorming here and we need to go get some answers to some basic questions about 
typically these are things like workflow, uh, the way they, you know, what data do they have coming in? Um, what's their process as they're doing this? What, how do they want to see the data coming out and that kind of thing. So in that kind of situation, um, I think what's best is to actually see if you can build some scenarios, some storyboards um, uh, in which you hypothesize not what the screens or exactly what the interface is going to look like. You're not prototyping, but you are mapping out a process. You're mapping out choices, and then you're going to you're still going to have a scenario, okay? And you're still going to have a task, but basically you're saying, okay, here's a scenario. You know, let's say that that you just went on a trip and uh, now you need to submit your expenses. So like, um, here's, here's, a, here's an example of how you might do that. You might, you know, gather all your receipts and then go to the software and put them in. Is that you know, does that fit? Is that what you have in mind when if I talk about submitting your expenses? Or, you know, usually we do we need to do these kind of feedback sessions when we have a, a much more complicated process and we're not sure of the steps in there. So we draw it out. Um, you know, think about um uh drawing out a story. Sometimes these look like little uh graphic novels or you know, we'll have actually literally sketches of you know, oh, here's a person, here's the nurse in the medical clinic, and she's with a patient. That's one frame in our story. And uh, we kind of say what she's doing. Then we have another frame. What is she doing? And then another frame. And so we get feedback on whatever it is we need feedback on. It might be the process, might be the inputs, might be the outputs, might be the steps in between, uh, the kinds of interactions, the equipment that they're interacting with, and we get feedback. Is this accurate? Is this the way they would want to do it? Does this fit the way they do it now? Um, and and we all kinds of questions that we can ask, but we're not testing the product. We're not evaluating the user experience of the product. We're trying to get answers to some of our questions about how the users do that specific task. So it's quite different. It's quite different than doing um, evaluative research. Now, sometimes what I have is I have people that want to do both and they want to combine them into one session. Uh, or actually, I'm going to hold on to that thought because I want to talk about generative research, the, the last box all the way on the one side, uh, because that's another one that people want to combine. Um, so hold off on that combine question, because I'm going to come back and talk about it. But let's first talk about what is generative research? What does that mean? How is that different from the middle box of a user feedback ses session? And I, I do have to admit that these lines of distinction could get a little fuzzy, uh, the difference between generative research and user feedback. But I'm going to phrase it this way. Typically, uh, user feedback is you have made some initial design and or process decisions, and you want to get feedback on whether those are accurate, and you want to get some more details about each step so that you can go and create a prototype or the product. Generative research is even earlier than that. I don't have a storyboard of the process and the steps and the inputs and the outputs that I want to get your feedback on because I haven't even gotten there yet. There's I, there's big missing holes in our knowledge that we have to fill before we can even uh, posit a flow uh, or a possible design. 
we, there's just all kinds of basics we don't know. Maybe we don't know about who the different personas are that are doing this. Maybe we um, don't have a clue at all about what the process is. So we can't show them a process that we designed that we think makes sense because we don't have any idea what the process is. And so we got to go find out. And that's what I can, these are the things I would consider with generative research. And so that's really different than either user feedback on preliminary design decisions or evaluation test. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I have um, one, one uh, simple calculator. Oh yeah, are you taking us back to the other conversation? Well, this is, no, it's somewhat related because okay. they have these. Um, so I'm looking at Neil Patel. Yeah. At dot com, and he has an A/B testing calculator, and yeah, and it's interesting because uh, it's like uh, basically you enter the number of people in your study. Yeah. And the number of people that did X, and they're talking about conversions but it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, because you said A-B testing, so that's usually... Right, yeah. we're comparing one population... We have this design of the... This version of the website versus, the versus other. another one. By the way, Amazon does this at all, all the time, all the time, all the time. They're constantly testing this. They When you go to their site, it never looks the same, and they're probably testing an A-B version at the moment. Okay, go ahead. So how many people do you want to be in your user test? Are you asking me? Yeah. Make For it, an A-B test or just in general? No, this is this. We're, we're using this calculator. It's just running. All right. I've, I want to, I'm thinking about 10 people. 10 people. Okay. Yeah. And in before the test, yeah. there's maybe a task or confusion yeah. or whatever the soft topic is. Yeah. What number of people would you expect to do a thing? So whatever think, you're trying to test. I think eight people are going to do X. Okay. So uh, you, you'll be amazed that I, in one, I had 10 people and eight, even before you said it, I came up with the exact same numbers. Okay. So, all right. Now you run the yeah. test and, yeah. out, and there are 10 people. Yeah. You run. And what, how many people did the thing that you thought? Eight. I said, I thought eight. No, no, no. But then you ran the test and you found what we would think of just as a normal thing. Oh, this was a significant, we found something. That oh, found according. something different than what I expected. Yeah. Cause something didn't oh, go to only four to people did it. I also put in 10 and four. So we picked the, God, literally the exact same that's sample weird. size. That's scary. Okay. According to uh, Neil Patel's calculator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So 10 out of eight, that's 80% of people did one thing versus yeah. 10, four out of 10. That's 40% yeah. actually. Yeah. So we're looking at actually 2x the, yes. what's, and they would call an A-B test a conversion rate in this way, yes. to con doing the thing we want rate. Yes. And according to this, it says that uh, even with this small sample size of 10 people, yeah, you can get a 98% uh, confidence in a That's role. pretty high. That, that there is a difference that the changes will Will are, cause are, are significant. Yeah, are significant. And and says your A B your your test is statistically significant. Interesting. So even with ten people, if you get big enough margins, if you get big enough results, yes. Yeah, if you're if you're seeing something big enough, even with ten, you can get statistically significant results. So if it was eight versus seven, what would the answer tell you? If you if we thought there'd At be ten, eight, yeah, if we thought. Uh, at seven, there is a, uh, it's not statistically significant, 70% yeah. confidence interval. Yeah. So that's not, you know, statistically, you, statistically significant traditionally is over 95%. Yeah. So, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah. So if you, uh, by the way, so if, if we did instead of 10, if we had, you know, 20 people, which is a very healthy test and 14 people did it one way and we'll just say, you know, eight people did it the other. Yeah. You know, so now that's only five difference out of 20. So this yeah. is a little more nuanced. You still get 98%. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah. just kind of, uh, just kind of 
Yeah, that's interesting. interesting. So yeah, so it, it does. It I, I I have verified that what I was saying I think stands up. Yeah, uh, it's not it's not again perfectly academically. I mean, you know, you could probably quibble, yeah. but but you can find statistically significant results. Yeah, in small I, 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 like I said, I am really differences. I'm really glad that you you raised it, and I, and I think it might be worth you know checking it out and. You know, these days there are, I think Neil Patel is good. I think Jeff Searle is good. So, uh, you know, if you uh, just make sure you're, you know, dealing with somebody who knows what they're doing. And there are a lot of these calculators online and you can, you can try them out and see. And that can help, also help you figure out, you know, how, how many people should we, you know, run it, run in our test. But, um, yeah, so it kind of depends on what, what you want to do. You know, the other, the other thing that complicates it, of course, Guthrie, is that a lot of times, you know, it's like, oh, well, we want to know about people who are current customers, but then we also want to know about, we want to run the test with prospective customers, or we want to, you know, we want to do this with people who are experienced engineers, as well as people who have just graduated from college, right? So now, and then, oh, well, we want to do the U.S. and then Europe and then Asia. So, and we want to do uh, people over 50 and under 50. And now we have like, you know, and and therefore we're going to run 12 people per, per cell. And now instead of just running, you know, 12 people, we're running like 124 people. I mean, that it can get away with you pretty fast if you don't, if you don't. Yeah. And now, and fast. now, and now we have to start talking about heteroskedasticity. No, you it don't. It all falls apart. <laughs> I don't even know what that word is. My favorite word from all my statistics classes, oh my heteroskedasticity. God. Okay. I, I, if we have time at the end, I'll let you say what that is. All right. Okay. All right. I just, I have a few more things that I want to talk about. I want to talk about, um, can you combine these? Because I kind of warned you that you shouldn't. I mean, can I can I do a generative research study and also get user feedback and also do an evaluative, evaluative research at the same time? I'm going to say, first of all, no, don't do that. You don't do all three for sure. Can you do two out of the three? A little bit maybe. So for example, maybe I want to do an evaluative uh, research study uh, I, I have a product or a prototype. I want to get exact feedback on the tasks. And then if we have time, I just want to check one or two things, right? Like I want to check, uh, you know, maybe I want to validate the persona, you know, so I just want to check with them. So how many years have you been working as an engineer? And, you know, uh, have you used this software before? So I'm just checking some of my persona decisions. Or maybe, um, maybe I have a little bit, you know, I, I have them do the evaluative. And then at the end, I want to show them a storyboard with a really different process that does, is not at all the way they just did the test and, and get their feedback on that. So what I'm doing is I'm mainly doing an evaluative study and I'm adding in a little bit of a user feedback session. So you can do that, okay? But you got to be careful. You want to choose, you know, mainly I'm doing generative research. There's just a lot of stuff I don't know, and I'm going to go in depth with interviews and, and so on, or mainly I'm doing evaluative research. I'm going to have them do tasks with the product, or mainly I'm doing user feedback session where I show them preliminary design concepts and get their feedback on it. I'm mainly doing one of those three and maybe I can throw in a tiny bit of one of the others. And I say that because I have seen, I get, you know, people show me a lot. I do a lot of mentoring and just last week, that's right, a client um, that was doing, they were supposed to be doing evaluative research and they showed me their protocol, right? So remember the protocol is the detail steps that the researcher is going to go through it. We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce myself and then I'm going to demonstrate the think aloud technique. And then I'm going to uh, ask them to do that first task. That's really easy. And then I'm going to ask them to do this task. Here's the scenario. Here's the tasks, right? That's your protocol. It lays out in detail what you're going to be doing. You have a protocol 
if you're doing evaluative research, you have a protocol. If you're doing uh, a, a, a user feedback session, you have a protocol. If you're doing generative research, e any of these has a protocol. They look really different, right? Because the three types of research are different. Um, but I, I, this one client said, here's our protocol. And it was just so confusing. It was like this big mishmash. First, I had him do a task. Then they showed him a storyboard and asked some, uh, you know, user feedback sessions. Then they then they had them do another test. Then they went and did this really in-depth interview. Tell me about the type of projects that you do. And it was just like all over the place. And I said, you know, whoa, whoa, you can't. First of all, you have 45 minutes. You're not going to make it through a third, even a third of this. Just you're not. So, and secondly, you're going to, it's going to be so confusing for you as a researcher to analyze this data and for the for the people doing the study because you're just all over the place. And it was like, no, you have to decide what's the primary type of research you're doing for this study. And it has to be based on that. And then I'll let you throw in one or two other things maybe at the end if you have time. Uh, that are either more user feedback or more generative. So it's a mistake I see people make. And it's, you know, they're excited and they're finally going to get to do some research and maybe it's hard to get users and and so on. But really, you'll end up with a mishmash. You won't be happy. So decide. A muddle. What? You'll end a up muddle. in a muddle. We haven't yeah. talked about what a muddle is, Guthrie. Susan's all about the muddle. Exactly. Have we even done a podcast episode about the model? I don't think so. Maybe. We must have brought it up. I don't know. We're going to have to go find out. Yes, you'll end up in a model, which is not a good place to be. So, All right, Guthrie. Um, man, I can talk a lot about research, can't I? I would say you've made a career. Uh, <laughs> I, so. love, I love UX yeah. and design research. I it's just, so. it's a great... It's a great thing to do. Uh, you never stop learning. Better, better, and better ways to do it. It never, to me, it never, it really doesn't get boring. Except with one exception. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of interviewing of of uh, candidates for a client who's doing a bunch of hiring of UX people. And I know this is a you know, we've asked this question when we've when we've hired people too, which is, you know, what what's one thing you've done a lot of that you never, <laughs> if you never did again, you'd be perfectly fine with? And they always say, user tests. Then then they'll say, I love it, it's great technique, but personally, I don't have to run another one. <laughs> so it is like I said, the gold standard. But if you've done five thousand of them, <laughs> you probably are willing to let somebody else take a turn for a while, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, now I get to let everyone know the difference what? between homo and hetero. Oh, okay. Go and ahead. Thing. What is this word? So when you're doing regression analysis, yeah, like an ordinary least squares, you are relying on a homogeneity of variance or a homo scedasticity. Oh so this God. would mean like if you plot, let's just say you have 100 people and you're measuring yeah. the time it takes them to complete a task. Okay. If you have homoscedasticity, it means the people who complete the task in 10 minutes, there should be a variance of the people who complete, you know, within one or two minutes at 10, about the same as the people who completed at 15. Okay, so, so there's a similar amount of variability. Yes, whereas if you take 100 minutes to complete the task, yes. you would expect that the people around there uh, also um, uh, uh, are completing it at 101, 102, yeah, yeah, 100, yeah. You know, 90, 98. There's also yes. a minute or two variance. So the variance between the low and the high is the same. You have a whole yes. variance or a whole Okay, I like that, yes. And that is how you can figure out whether your regression is statistically significant. Yes. If you have heteroscedasticity, but you are using a model that doesn't correct for heteroscedasticity of error. You're going yes. to get, um, uh, you're going to, you're going to have uh, 
statistically significant errors. You're going to have right. errors that are messing with what you what it is actually statistically right because there's too much variability. There's too much. Uh, there, there. No, 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 no. It's no. not that there's too much variability. It's fine to have lots of variability. Okay. Your variability is uh, uh, your variability uh, is connected with itself. There is there is a um, there's a link between variants. It's not and, in, in, it's not independent. It's not random variants. Yes, yes, yes. There's there's a. It's dependent on dependent. another variable, and that and here, is here's a perfect example. Results. Okay. Think of um, runners in a marathon. Yeah. So the people who run the marathon in you know five hours. Yeah. Usually. Uh, given a random person who runs a marathon in five hours, you know, some days they're 505, some days right. they're or four, even, you know, five. Yeah, four and so, a half. So there's variants of like yeah. four to five minutes yeah. for runners there. People who are, maybe it's one of their first marathons. Or like something. I'm running the marathon? That's yeah, what you're right? trying to tell yeah, me. Yeah, okay, yeah. Try, you know, it's it's hour 12, you know, right. hour, you know, eight, hour <laughs> yeah, that's 20, me. whatever. They've closed up the finish yeah, line. the walkers at the end. You know, their variance from race to race is going to be maybe an hour oh, between one. Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 if you just assume that there's homeless statistics and you're trying to figure out whether yeah. there's different variables related, uh, you're going to get wrong answers unless you account for the the he, the, the heteroskedastic in that in that the variance yes. of of how fast a runner finishes the line in any any given race is correlated with how fast they finish the race. Right. So runners that are trainers that are that right. run quickly, they generally have a lower variance than people who, mm-hmm. you know, are not mm-hmm. that much. So you can't assume so so the normal regression analysis assumes homeless get acidity. And if you have and correlation true, in your variance, you are gonna run into trouble. Results. Okay. So there you go, Guthrie. This, by the way, is of course uh, using logarithmic data. And that's hey, you know, someday we could do a whole session on uh, a statistics that uh, researchers need to know. I love statistics. You know that. I used to teach it, although I never taught that, what you just uh, You about. taught statistics. You didn't teach. This is going to be, uh, this is going to be like um, macro. Uh, uh, why am I completely blanking the word? It's not macro. <laughs> it's... Uh, oh my god! Uh, whatever, whatever the <laughs> whatever thing it was, I, I didn't teach it. Oh my god! I taught basic. It's the thing that uses linear algebra to figure out. The okay, I I taught basic statistics. I yeah. took a lot. I took advanced statistics, but I didn't teach it. I'm sorry for about. It's been in my defense. It's been like. No, it's nice to know about this stuff. It's been a man. lot longer for me than it has been for you. Yeah, we it's could, been. Could say that. It's been a long time, though. You know, one of the nice things about teaching statistics is that it really doesn't change. You know, That's you're teaching true. world history twenty years That's ago. That's true. It doesn't you know, change. Learn all it's, the uh, stuff. It's, a, it's, it's. I love it. That's a really good idea. The definition <laughs> of mean, median, and mode has not changed since yeah, I first taught it a very uh, long time ago. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Guthrie, um, we've managed to use up all of our time, which we're very good at. Mm-hmm. And uh, if people want to get hold of us, they can email us at? Econometrics. No. That's the word. Where they email us. That's, 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 the, that's, the, that's the type. It's not statistics. It's econometrics. Thank that's you. That. If they want if they want <laughs> to email us, where do they email us? Info at the team, Okay. Sorry for Thanks a lot, Guthrie. Thanks, everyone. Heter- watch out for your heteroscedicity or whatever it's called. Yep, yep, yep. Bye. Bye.